You're listening to In Clear Focus, a unique perspective on the business of advertising, produced weekly by Big Eye. Hello, I'm your host, Adrian Tennant, VP of Insights at Big Eye, an audience-focused, creative-driven, full-service advertising agency. We're based in Orlando, Florida, but serve clients across the United States and beyond. Thank you for joining us. Today, we're going to be talking about brand safety online. In July of 2017, consumer packaged goods giant Procter & Gamble announced that it had cut back its expenditure on digital advertising by $140 million due to concerns about where ads for its brands were appearing. In explaining its decision, P&G said that it had decided to restrict spending in digital forums where it felt its ads were not being placed according to P&G's brand standards. Earlier that year, P&G had pulled its advertising from YouTube completely after discovering that ads bought programmatically, that is via an automated system, had too often appeared next to offensive material. The industry term for this is negative ad adjacency. In April of last year, 2019, Procter & Gamble's chief brand officer, Mark Pritchard, issued a call to entirely reinvent the digital media supply chain. In order to understand why brand safety is a concern and why attempts to bring transparency to the current ecosystem have trouble keeping pace with its rapid growth, we need to recap the way that digital advertising works today. At the top of the supply chain are the marketers for brands that want to reach prospective customers. They have marketing budgets, a portion of which goes to advertising. The brands work with advertising agencies like Big Eye and we develop the creative, the ads themselves, and plan where the ads will be shown, the media. We then work with a number of third parties purchasing the inventory or ad space on networks of websites. And these sites, which is where digital ads appear, are owned by publishers who ultimately receive payment for the advertising that appears on their sites. At least that's how it's supposed to work. To talk about the complexity of the digital ecosystem and how brands and publishers can ensure their advertising avoids negative adjacency, I'm joined today by Jonathan Marciano, Director of Communications at Check, an artificial intelligence-driven ad verification service. In his role, Jonathan manages public relations, editorial content, marketing and communications and he's the author of numerous landmark white papers that have been covered across the digital advertising industry and in media, including the New York Times, Fast Company, Ad Age, and CNBC, among others. Welcome to In Clear Focus, Jonathan. Hi, Adrian. Thanks so much for having me. What is your definition of brand safety? Yeah, so brand safety um, is basically the controls that companies in the digital advertising um, supply chain use to protect brands against negative impacts to their reputation. Right. Where does ad verification sit within that? Yeah, so as you sort of outlined uh, in your in your great introduction, there have been a number of uh, brand safety incidents. Sort of most memorably was the the Times uh, of London, I think, in two thousand and seventeen, where they had a front page uh, revealing that some of the top brands were appearing to finance programmatically the videos and, and uh, stories about uh, terrorism and ISIS, and this was a big wake-up call, I think, for the entire digital advertising space, where basically brands couldn't couldn't understand and couldn't defend why their ads were being served in such uh, toxic um, environments. And these uh, incidents have kind of continued to grow, and, and periodically uh, brands have been called out for supporting everything from false information to terrorism to being advertised against negative stories, even about their own companies. And so what came in its place was a number of ad verification players who were basically there to act as a bit of a police policeman to prevent uh, the brands from appearing against this uh, negative content. Now, I understand Czech published a report called The Brand Safety Effect 
in October of 2018, which was based on a study you guys undertook with BMW and Hulu. What can you tell us about the research design and the methodology that you employed, first of all? Yeah, so this was trying to get to the bottom of whether any of this you know, really matters. Does a consumer who sees a brand next to a, a nicest video really care? Does it really associate uh, a brand with that? Um, and we saw the answer was, in fact, yes, they, they do know and they do recognize uh, the brands and they do have recall of the brand and the context in which um, sometimes horrific content is, is delivered. So we found in the research, which was with 2000 consumers, there was strong sentiment about how brands were you know, the company that brands were keeping uh, online. So the brands were shown adverts in basically unsafe brand, uh, unsafe content. So for instance, a classic example was an airline ad next to an article about uh, an airline forcibly removing a passenger, soda ad in front of uh, content about diabetes. And basically the chief insight was that was that many consumers viewed this as, uh, as an intentional endorsement for this negative content. I think some of the feedback we had that it was manipulative, that it was disturbing, that they appeared to be generating revenue through disaster. Um, um, and I think sort of the, the headline figure was that there was a 2.8 uh, times reduction in consumers' uh, intent to associate with this brand. So really hinting at uh, an effect on the, on the bottom line. We're very concerned as brand marketers about perceptions of quality. You know, we will often track purchase intent uh, and, of course, the likelihood to recommend to family and friends. So I think what I'm hearing is that those kinds of perceptions were indeed very negatively impacted as a result of this negative ad adjacency. That's right. So could you tell me how do brand safety platforms typically work? So up until now, up until new players such as Czech. Basically, I, I, it, there's this very crude and I'd say pretty unsophisticated uh, solution to the problem, which is this idea of uh, keyword blacklists, which have been created in the name of brand safety. So these are basically words, blacklists that are deemed too dangerous for advertisers to have appear beside. So this is particularly talking about uh, you know, news content, so the New York Times or globally online, uh, the news industry. So anyone advertising against these sorts of sites, if an online news story contains words such as sex or terror or ISIS or killing, then the concerned advertiser stays clear. They basically uh, are prevented from serving ads uh, against any of that content and it basically demonetizes the content for the publisher and the side effect is that it means that the reach of the brands themselves to reach engaged consumers uh, reading this type of content is diminished. Why is it that keyword blacklists came to dominate the technology for brand safety? I think because it's a fairly simple, say a little bit of a lazy solution. It's um, it was a way to uh, ostensibly get around this problem to kind of pr pr have a bit of a band-aid solution to the problem. And I think in, in theory, it's not bad once the keyword blacklists kind of became manageable when you're talking about a few words like killing and attack. But what's happened is the, the number of keywords have increased to a crazy degree where there's now 3,000 keywords um, on blacklists and brands are basically having to avoid the news completely because there's very, very little content that they can uh, appear next to. Um, and that's affecting, well, the whole system because it's uh, hurting brands' reach, it's uh, hurting premium publishers, and it's forcing um, advertisers to go to kind of the lowest common denominator and go to cheaper clicks, which are rife with uh, fraud and bad associations, uh, and basically are hurting you know, the ultimate purpose of uh, advertising, which is to, to create leads or convert customers. Right. Now, just last month, you published the economic cost of keyword blacklists for online news publishers. And this was a report that you undertook with the Merrick School of Business at the University of Baltimore. Um, in the study, the economic price paid by a publishers from incorrect blocking of safe content on premium news sites was in fact quantified. What can you tell us about the research design and the methodology that you used for this study? 
Yeah, so this is uh, so we found so in the US alone that uh, 2.8 billion is lost by uh, news sites every year. Well, in 2019, uh, because of, of incorrect flagging of their most uh, read online content. So this does assume that there are certain flags uh, that the. And it shows that there are certain um, blocking that is 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 uh, justified, but basically we found that uh, this that the eighty percent of ads uh, served to premium publishers are subject to keyword blacklists. Uh, I think the IAB actually came up with a figure closer to ninety five percent, which makes us even a bit more bit, bit conservative in our findings. But these blacklists were designed, uh, as we said, on brand safety grounds by these uh, ad verification providers. So to prevent brands from appearing next to um, toxic uh, news content. However, by analyzing the actual stories that would have been blocked by uh, these um, blacklists across um, 20 premium news sites, including the New York Times and CNN, Guardian, we saw that around 40% of uh, global premium media inventory is actually brand safe. But of the safe content, of this sort of content that is, is really, uh, we, we see all the brand safety guidelines from the brands that, that of this safe, that, that is basically 57% that is safe, is, is being actually blocked, even though it's safe. Because these ad verification blacklists basically don't understand words such as kill, dead, shoot, and injury, which you know, could be talking about, uh, you know, an NBA player killing it in a game or an injury in a, in, a, in a football game. In particular, we also found that LGBTQ news publishers are seeing 73% of their uh, inventory being denied through uh, keywords such as lesbian, bisexual and same sex. And so based on the uh, annual spend, say, in the U.S. of 12 billion on online uh, U.S. news advertising, uh, we calculated that there's a, at least $2.8 billion uh, a year due to incorrect flagging for brand safety, which, as you can imagine, is a, for a hard-pressed industry that's uh, already struggling is a, a big, big pain point. One thing that stood out to me in the report was the way in which even, you know, really family friendly content around the launch of Disney Plus's service was flagged as unsafe. Can you can you talk to that? Of course, yes. Yeah. So so we looked at uh, Google every year produces what is the most search trend of the year. And in 2019, unsurprisingly, a lot of anticipation around Disney Plus, which is about, I think, as brand safe as you could probably uh, imagine uh, a story could be a, a business which is solidly protective of its brand. But basically, with the, with stories about uh, Disney Plus proliferating, like we found that many you know, millions of oppressions couldn't be uh, monetized because of uh, entertainment, because of uh, basically there were stories about Disney's back catalog and what would be on the new platform. And, and it included things like Star Wars, Attack of the Clones. And simply that one word attack meant that brands were were not able to advertise against this uh, against this news or the Avengers uh, have uh, one of the first uh, Avengers movies uh, called uh, Infinity War uh, and we remember at the time uh, when Infinity War came out a lot of publishers were turning to us uh, and saying that they were basically seeing a huge drop off of, of revenue and all of these reviews of, 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 the, of the movie all these tie-ins to the movies all this buzz was basically unmonetizable uh, and put in the same uh, bucket as uh, terrorism uh, and ISIS. All right. Now, you had just referenced, uh, in fact, you wrote a, an opinion piece for the World Advertising Resource Center highlighting the ways that keyword blacklists have unintended yet very adverse effects on LGBTQ consumers and the marketers and publishers who serve the community. Can you talk a little bit more about what you learned? Yeah, so I, so it goes back to this figure that, so in general, there's a 57% uh, blocking of safe online news content. But when we started applying our methodology to LGBTQ publications like The Advocate and Pink News, we found that there was a 77% blocking of their safe content. So there are there were some 
stories which are, you know, inarguably not safe. So there was stories of murder and those are fine not to be monetized. But it was stories about a lesbian couple that were being blocked. It was stories about Killing Eve because it mentioned uh, to TV series where they mentioned uh, um, a lesbian scenario. It was stories about same sex. So they were being blocked because of stories about, you know, because of these key words such as same sex or lesbian uh, and this, I think, uh, the point I, I wanted to make in the article was every every year in Pride Month, we see every brand on LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook and, and and all the platforms changing their logos and appearing, you know, LGBTQ friendly. But when it comes to programmatic advertising, they're basically denying uh, advertising to stories that the community needs to uh, survive. And and as a result, um, some publishers have already been uh, forced to close because they've been denied advertising. Uh, And others, it's a a daily struggle. And I think that that's that's unjust and that's, that's unfair. We've talked a lot about the problem. Talk to us about Czech and why your solution is different. So, yeah, I mean, uh, thankfully, there's been advances since uh, this sort of decades old uh, technology of, of, of keywords. And to be fair, some of the uh, advertising players uh, who are not Czech have also uh, started to realize that this situation is just no longer sustainable. And they've also started exploring um, AI options. But because Czech is a fairly young company founded in 2016, um, we look at every problem anew. So we didn't have any of the uh, you know previous kind of keyword solutions, and we would no, no one in uh, I think no one in the industry who was coming fresh to this problem would ever say that that was a, a good solution. So so Czech invested a lot of. Uh, talent and energy and money in uh, AI to solve the brand safety issue, and in this in this situation, AI completes sequences to understand the meaning of the text, and it understands the context of a story uh, similar to how we read and understand stories. It essentially builds up a full picture of what the story is and and is not. So this enables sort of a more contextual approach. So if I give you an example, um, if there's a to go back to some of the things that people, the brands certainly don't like uh, appearing next to. If a fast food restaurant chain wants to avoid appearing next to uh, content about obesity, for instance. So we've trained the AI to define obesity as a category, but also trained it to understand uh, subterms uh, such as heart disease and diabetes. So this helps to show what a piece of content is. And it doesn't just look at one specific keyword, but it analyzes how many category subterms are present in a, in a, in a piece uh, and the relationship between them. So this allows the AI to understand if, if uh, an obesity-related word is just random or if it's actually about obesity. So in another way, uh, previously a story that would mention alcohol would be blocked, but this AI enables, the through its training, it understands whether it's simply a, a mention of alcohol for a recipe or if it's something thing that is brand unsafe, such as driving under the influence. So this basically is a way for um, brands to decide what is, you know, brand safe and the AI based on their parameters will be a far uh, more human judge of uh, brand safety than keywords. Right, understanding. So this is artificial intelligence. That's right. So- that's machine learning, that's artificial intelligence. So for instance, to avoid the, uh, in terms of uh, artificial intelligence, like what's important is the, the training um, and the data. And so for instance, so to avoid kind of this silly situation of Avengers being uh, blocked or Disney being blocked, our AI has been trained on, on film scripts and reviews of TV shows and scripts. So it knows what goes into a story uh, about uh, film and movies and uh, singers so that it knows that the Avengers is not a real war, whereas it would understand based on uh, a story about uh, an invasion in Iraq, for instance, that that is a real war. Um, it sort of pieces together the puzzle in, in milliseconds to decide whether something should be uh, served or not against that content. Where does Czech sit in that digital supply chain? 
So Czech, we work mostly with brands. So we protect brands from, well, from fraud, as I said before, from advertising fraud, which itself is a $23 billion problem. And we also pre prevent their uh, ads from appearing next to uh, unsavory content. So mostly with brands, obviously, they're the ones that are, you know, have the budget uh, as well with agencies. Uh, we can also uh, integrate with publishers as well, but we have less, less publisher clients. Right. And we're talking about a software as a service model? That's right. So it's a SaaS model. It has a very, very impressive dashboard. You're given instantaneous data on why your ads weren't served. We show you every URL that was blocked. Uh, and this basically shows how much you're saving. And it's also very open and transparent. So we're not saying uh, doing this behind closed doors, we're showing you all the data and clients have appreciated that. They, there's a, not much openness and transparency in, in, in digital advertising and they appreciate that uh, they can mark our homework and if there are any improvements that can be made, we can, we can work on it. Wow. Now, as you know, Big Eye is a full service agency. What are some of the conversations that you think we need to be having with our clients about just these issues? It comes down to, yeah, talking to clients about, first of all, on the, on the one side, making sure that you're protected from ensuring that your brands aren't served in, in bad places. And we shouldn't hide behind that we just simply don't know where programmatic ads are being served or what they're funding, because that's, it's not the case. We can, we, that there is a way to plan and execute your campaign so that you are putting your brand and your you know, revenue in the best position, because ultimately, if it, not only are you serving ads on uh, content that uh, is undesirable, it's also probably not the audience you want to reach. And so it's basically wasted money, wasted spending that could be going elsewhere. Jonathan, if listeners want to learn more about Czech, where can they find information? Yeah, so probably the best place is our website, www.check, which is uh, with a Q, so C-H-E-Q, www.check.ai. And there you can find out all the information, uh, schedule a demo and get a pilot. Right. And what books, articles or other resources would you recommend for listeners that want to learn more about ad verification in general or brand safety in particular? So I always read Dr. Fu's articles about fraud um, and brand safety, uh, Augustine Fu. He's, he's not very complimentary about uh, our verification players, but he's always very uh, sharp with his points and uh, he presents a lot of challenges to the industry. So I like him. There's, um, you know, the, the news out of Digiday and Ad Age report a lot on uh, some of the challenges about blacklists. They're talking a lot more about the challenges that publishers face. So yeah, those, those would be some, some to look out for. Mm, perfect. You were very modest. You didn't include your own articles in there. But I have to say, everything that's been written by Jonathan is also very, very on point. So thank you. All right. Jonathan Marciano, Director of Communications at Czech. It's been our pleasure to have you on In Clear Focus today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Adrian. It's been a pleasure. My thanks to our guest, Jonathan Marciano, Director of Communications at Czech. You can find links to the resources we discussed on the InClear Focus page at BigEyeAgency.com under Insights. Just click on the button marked Podcast. Please consider subscribing to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player, and please rate and review the show. And if you have an Amazon Echo device, you can use the InClear Focus skill to add the podcast to your flash briefing. Thank you for listening to In Clear Focus, produced by Big Eye. I've been your host, Adrian Tennant. Until next week, goodbye.